Welcome everyone to the 99th Annual Convention Presidential Address and Awards Ceremony. We will begin this evening with President Stephen A. Beebe's Presidential Address, It's a Wonderful Discipline. Steve Beebe is both Regents Professor and University Distinguished Professor of Communication Studies at Texas State University. He has been Chair of the Department of Communication Studies since 1986. And he also served for many years as Associate Dean of the College of Fine Arts and Communication. Steve is the author or co-author of 12 books with most in multiple editions, more than 50 articles and book chapters, and more than 150 papers and professional presentations. Steve's research with a focus on instructional communication has appeared in such journals as Communication Education, Human Communication, Communication Research Reports, and several Russian language academic journals. In fact, Steve could be the poster child for internationalizing the discipline. I mean, look at him. He has been a visiting scholar at both the University of Oxford and the University of Cambridge. Not only does he love teaching his course on C.S. Lewis there, but at Oxford he discovered a brief manuscript by C.S. Lewis intended for a book about communication to be co-authored with J.R.R. Tolkien. He has given lectures and conference presentations throughout Europe, Asia, and Latin America. And he's a founding member of the Russian Communication Association. He's been instrumental, in fact, in establishing communication studies programs in that country. But wait, there's more. Steve is an active communication consultant, trainer, and speaker with many Fortune 500 clients, and he serves as a consultant for several national and state government organizations. The National Speakers Organization, Association, excuse me, named Steve Outstanding Communication Professor in America. At Texas State, Steve has received two of the institution's top awards, the President's Award for Excellence in Research and the President's Award for Excellence in Service. And he's received teaching awards at every single institution where he's taught, including being named Honors Professor of the Year at Texas State. Okay, those are all the accolades and honors and accomplishments. But what's joyful to know about Steve is that at heart he's still a small town Missouri boy <laughs> who served as president of his high school class, still plays cello, organ, and piano. In fact, I have it on good authority that he was playing the piano in the presidential suite. He sings bass in his choir, and he attends concerts in just about every city where he has a convention. So please join me in welcoming the warm, wonderful, witty Steve Beebe to the stage. Thank you, Kathy, for that very generous introduction. And thank you for an excellent convention. Please join me in congratulating. <laughs> an inspired theme about connections, and it's about connections that I'd like to speak with you this evening, your connection with NCA. But first, I need to thank some people who have been connected to me. We both started out as music majors, and then we, about the same time, we changed to communication. It was called public address and speech at that time. We also met in music theory class, and then we were in debate class together. The semester that I was in the theater directing class, she was in the theater acting class. We thought with that much in common, we should get acquainted. I want to thank my co-author, personal editor, best friend and wife of almost 40 years, Sue Beebe. Thank you. <laughs> I also 
want to thank the staff of NCO. Some of you have seen Executive Director Nancy Kidd and Associate Director Trevor Perry Giles, Associate Director Brad Mello, Chief of Staff Mark Fernando, Convention Coordinator Michelle Randall, each member of the staff is simply outstanding. And I know it was mentioned in a newsletter or two, but may have got lost in the, between the lines, but NCA was listed by the Nonprofit Times as one of the 50 best places to work in the United States. That's wonderful. Congratulations. <laughs> I've also been blessed with many teachers and mentors. My first speech teacher, Mary Harper, uh, I am just a small town boy from Grain Valley, Missouri, and that's where I first met Mary Harper and was introduced to this discipline. Um, I thank my teachers at the University of Central Missouri, including Richard Cheatham, who was my dean for 26 years at Texas State University. So thank you very much, Richard. <laughs> and I thank my mentors and teachers at the University of Missouri, Columbia, as well as my colleagues where I've worked. University of Miami, that's where I learned how to be a college professor. And at Texas State, where I've been for 28 years, I'm still learning how to be a college professor. Thank you to my friends and colleagues, and a special thank you to my Dean, Tim Mote. Thank you very much. Soon you're going to see it, as you have for about 70 years. It will show up on your TV screens, and sometimes you'll see it in the movie theater. Like an old friend, there will be Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life. Starring Jimmy Stewart as George Bailey, Donna Reed as his sweetheart and wife, Mary, and a memorable cast. Surely you've seen this classic story. Although it's set as a Christmas story, I think it's really more about Thanksgiving than it is any particular religious holiday. You know the plot, don't you, about George Bailey? Jimmy Stewart character who lives in Bedford Falls is the dutiful, hardworking son, brother. He has big dreams. He has big plans. But each time... He's ready to leave, he's poised to leave, something interrupts, and he stays behind. After his father's death, George reluctantly becomes head of his father's building and loan, marries his sweetheart Mary, and has a house full of kids. But when things get stressful because of an error by Uncle Billy and the unscrupulous plotting of Mr. Potter, George walks out on a snowy night, makes his way to a bridge over the river, concludes he's worth more dead than alive, looks in the water, is about ready to jump. That's when Clarence, his guardian angel, jumps in the water, saves him. And that's where Clarence has the idea that to help George understand the value and importance of his life, life, what would it be if he did not exist? This evening, for just a few moments, I would like to play the role of Clarence Oddbody, Angel Second Class. Now, I know like uh, George ba Bailey, you'd say, yeah, you're just the kind of angel I expect I'd get. But <laughs> be that as it may. How would you be different if there were no NCA? Collectively, how would we be different if there were no NCA? How would the world be different? there were no NCA. I have three ideas to share with you. First, without NCA, there would be no national network of teachers and scholars to support what we do, what we do to teach and research. No larger framework, no space where we can do our work. I got a glimpse of what it would be like if there were no NCA. It was 20 years ago, this year, 1993, that I had the opportunity to visit Russia with some colleagues, including my dean, Richard Cheatham. And we were visiting, I was sort of an add-on at the last moment, with primarily music faculty, a history professor, a chemistry professor, and we were at various Russian universities. And we would uh, be introduced to the rector, and each one would kind of say, well, I'm a professor of chemistry, I'm a professor of history, et cetera. And they got to me, and I'd say, well, I teach speech communication or communication studies. And typically there would be sort of a cocked head with, what's that? Well, I would give them my elevator speech. Surely you have an elevator speech about the discipline. I would hand them the brochure about my department. 
Um, a couple of them said, oh, Dale Carnegie. That's what they knew. <laughs> Virtually every academic that I met did not know about the discipline of communication. And uh, since it was 1993, shortly after the fall of communism, that would make sense. Under communism, what you and I do for a living probably is not what the communist leaders would want to have as departments in the Soviet Union. So I thought it'd be fun to share information about communication with my Russian colleagues. So I visited several Russian universities, got a grant, worked with the American Embassy in Moscow, worked with Moscow State University, and began sharing information about communication. But it wasn't long before I realized I was wrong. What I believed at first was that my colleagues in Russia did not study communication. They did. It was simply not found in a single academic institution. It was embedded in a variety of other disciplines. Conflict management was taught in political science. Language was taught in philology, linguistics, English, sociology, psychology. It was there, but just not organized. That's when I realized the importance of us. The power of being together a national network. Yes, we have different points of view in this room about what we study. That is our power. That is what gives us strength. And so when I realized that yes, communication exists, you cannot not study communication. <laughs> I'm pleased to report that there now is a Russian Communication Association. Last year I spoke at the sixth biannual conference in Krasnoyarsk, Russia, in Siberia. Uh, just last month, I was at a Russian university that 11 years ago had no curriculum in communication, but as I arrived on campus just a few weeks ago, they have a rich curriculum in intercultural communication. They now, they now offer a doctorate in intercultural communication, business communication. Very exciting. What my experience in Russia helped me realize is the power of us together. What was important about 1914 was that it was a national movement together. Communication is our academic home. In fact, there's some research that says we are more likely to identify with our discipline, with the areas you teach, than even your academic discipline. Now, some people know that I'm interested in, in narrative archetypes. When I ran for this position four years ago in my vision statement, I talked about some of those archetypes based on a book by Christopher Booker. Booker believes that of all the stories ever written, ever, there are only seven basic plots. Let's try that out. Here's what I want you to do. Do you have a favorite story? Maybe a story you read to your kids. Could be from a movie, could be from a play. Think about that story. Here are the seven plots that Christopher Booker suggests that all stories are about these seven plots. See if it works. Here we go. Rags to Riches, The Quest, Voyage and Return, Overcoming the Monster is a plot, Rebirth or Shadow and Delight. Number six is Comedy, which are problems and solutions. And number seven is Tragedy solutions and problems. <laughs> now, so that sounds very reductionistic. I'm not sure, S just seven plot, I think, in fact, I do think Christopher Booker is wrong. I do not believe there are seven basic plots. I believe there's one. I believe all plots are about the process of finding home. Rags to riches, then what? You build a new home with those riches. The quest for what? Home. Voyage and return where? You now know the answer to that question. <laughs> Finding home is fundamental to our own personal story. Now, by home, it's not always a literal place. It's a condition as well. NCA is like 
a giant hallway that connects the various rooms in our divisions, in our units. It's, that's where the rooms are, where there are friends and fireplaces and chairs and meals that nourish us, in our separate institutions where we do our work. NCA provides the hallway, the connections that link us together into our common disciplinary home. I don't claim that without NCA there would be no study of communication. We cannot not study what it is we do. But I do suggest that our national organization is what strengthens us, is what makes us powerful and important. In addition to providing a national home, second, without NCA, I believe, I believe we would have diminished information about that which we study, communication. We would have fewer journals, we would have fewer ideas about communication, fewer theories about communication, fewer principles about communication, less research about communication, less teaching about communication, less communication, knowledge. Let's take one, just journals. If there were no NCA, we would not have 11 journals. Let's try this Clarence Odd Body experiment. Imagine every article published in an NCA journal does not exist. What would that do to your vita? <laughs> what would that do to the citations in our books? What would that do to our textbooks? Well, the good thing is we would not have to worry about journal impact factors. <laughs> not 11 journals, but zero. Now, Kath Burton, if you're here, what I've, you may know the answer to this question, but I wondered, so how many pages of journals do we have? So I went back from 1915 to the Quarterly Journal of Public Speaking and tried to estimate, and the best figure I could came up, come up with is that uh, we've published 156,853 pages in our journals. I'm about six feet tall. Imagine a stack of journals ten times taller than I am. All gone, not here. Now, maybe you have said when you got a journal, oh, there's nothing in here for me. What is, what is this, this, what? But there's something there for someone, perhaps in another room. Perhaps that was not written for you. And it is the diversity of our rooms that give us strength, that give us power. Not only would there be diminished information, there'd be diminished information about teaching. That's our primary activity. In fact, in our 99 years ago, it was in our title, the National Association of Academic Teachers of Public Speaking. Teaching has been in our title for about a third of our existence. Finally went out about in the 40s, but it did not go out in what we do. It's the oldest copy I could find. This is a copy of Aristotle's rhetoric published in 1619. It's a first edition in the sense this was the first time Aristotle's rhetoric was published in an English-speaking country. Until 1619, all versions of Aristotle's rhetoric were published in Venice. This was published in London. Quintilian Institutes of oratory, 1625, a little newer, a little bit more contemporary. <laughs> Cicero, Rhetoric ad Herenium, 1547, for this particular volume I'm holding in my hand. We'd still have those texts. We'd still have those if we haven't had NCA. But what we would not have are the rich array of resources that build upon those principles included in those documents. No NCA, we wouldn't be here today. Where would you be? Probably in Boston. That's where the National Council of Teachers of English are meeting this very moment. No national network, diminished knowledge about communication. For my third point, I want to be more personal. 
was when George Bailey realized that he had an impact on his family and on his friends, that he realized the meaning of his life. He saw how relationships make a difference. Without NCA, we would not enjoy the relationships we have established with others. I believe I can prove my point. Look around you right now. Perhaps you came into this assembly with someone you know that you met because of our work together. Perhaps you're sitting next to them or you're making eye contact with them this very moment. <laughs> I know that I am. The relationships that we have built because of our connection to each other. And there's evidence in what we do and what we say that relationships are important to us. Just look, if someone were to do a content analysis of the last four or five themes of our conventions. In 1910, we built bridges, which suggests an emphasis on relationship. In 2011, we sought a voice. Last year, we celebrated community. Today, we're celebrating connections. Next year, we'll examine the presence of our pasts. Presence suggests an immediacy. Presence suggests the importance of relationships. Relationships are important to us. Just a few people we have lost this year diminishes us. We have lost Kenneth Brown, Mary Frances Hopkins, Dennis Borman, Bob Bostrom, Jack Farwin, Nancy Harper, Jimmy Trent, Bill Wilmont, Jim McCroskey, Sam Becker. Our relationships enrich us. The loss of relationships diminish us. NCA provides that place where we make those relationships. Even here, even now, even at this convention, this is our annual family reunion. In 1914, 17 people, as you now know from the stories, gathered to form this association. 1915, 60 people gathered. A hotel room cost a dollar and a half. 1916, 80 people attended, but they may not have been happy when they saw that hotel rates went up to $2. 1917, 100 people attended from about 78 institutions. The registration was only a dollar but only 84 people registered. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Won't call any names out there, that's all right. Why do we here? Why are we here? It's about relationships. I like what my mentor, Lauren Reed, said about why we gather here, the 41st president of this association. He wrote this in his narrative speech teacher, a random narrative written to commemorate our 75th anniversary. Here are the five reasons he gave for why it is we relate. We come to hear new ideas. We come to discover new books, resources, materials. Third, we come to renew acquaintances and to meet new ones. And then Professor Reed offered a couple of metaphors. He said, we come to climb out of our ruts and shatter our established routines. I like his final metaphor. He says, here we undergo intellectual dialysis that dislodges hardened concepts and renews our vitality. <laughs> I would add one more. I believe we come to relate to something larger than ourselves, to give meaning in those relationships. Over the years there have been conversations about what is it that causes us to relate? What is at our core? I'm always interested, and maybe you are too, when I go into a Barnes & Noble bookstore and I can find sections on sociology and psychology and English and literature and philosophy, engineering. Something's missing. Could it be our challenge in identifying what it is that gives us an easy identity? We've asked those questions for some time. It was 20 years ago in his presidential address that David Zareski asked, can you tell me what holds this field together? What is the central issue or organizing principle? How can I make sense of what we are doing? 
we are sense-making creatures and we seek that. I like what former president, NCA president Don Braithwaite said about us. NCA is the keeper of the discipline. I like that one. What is it that we keep? As you look at the literature, we've had conversations about that from time to time. Some suggest that it's the orality of our message or that we are speaking and speech is what it is that unites us. Others have made passionate ar ar uh, arguments for meaning. Some say it's about messages. More recently, we've had arguments that it's about text or some would say it's about power. What I would add to that, my nomination would be it's about relationships. It was Donald Bryant who said, rhetoric is the process of adapting ideas to people and people to ideas. What we do is about how we relate, whether it's in an audience, in a physician's office, with our kids. How do we relate? How do we understand those mysteries? And how do we improve upon that? Once George Bailey, had seen the past without him, he reached some affirming conclusions. He had made a difference in the lives of others. Yes, there were larger building and loan societies, but not more important. Yes, there are larger professional associations, but none more important in terms of our mission and what we do. What would your life be like without NCA? How has the soon to be 100 year old existence of this professional association made a difference in your life, in our life? I've suggested three things. There would be no national network. This is our home. This is our national canvas on which to paint our ideas and join together in forming that image. This is our hallway that connects us and gets us out of our rooms and brings us in a common room to celebrate through and with relationships. I've suggested, number two, that the world's knowledge of communication without us would be diminished. Our mission is to advance all forms of communication. Without NCA, I believe the world would have less information about what we believe can change the world. I've suggested that we would not enjoy the relationships we enjoy. In the great chain of being NCA, those of us present are linked to the chain of those in our pasts. Those of us in this room, we are the link to those who were with us last year and those who will be with us next year and the year after that. No NCA? <laughs> Let me summarize my three points with three words. There would be no national communication association. If there's a person I could nominate, it would be the George Bailey of our discipline. If you've read my last Spectra column, you might guess who I would nominate. Lauren Reed. I mentioned when I visited with the past presidents this afternoon that one of the highlights of my year was visiting my former teacher, my mentor in Columbia, Missouri twice this year and able to tell him how much I valued him. And I was able to say to him, as president of the National Communications Association, Lauren Reed, thank you for what you've done with us. He's published two articles when he was 102. <laughs> He's now 108. One website cites him as the 16th oldest man in the United States. Today he mostly sleeps, but when I ask him, what do you do? Well, he's still looking toward the future. He says, well, I get up and I read the stock markets. <laughs> then I check the sports. Lauren was born in 1905, just about the same year the Bailey Brothers Building and Loan Society was established. In 1928, in the movie, the year of that dance where the floor opened up and the swimming pool appeared, 
1928, Lauren Reed was 23, about the same age. So when you watch that movie this season, think about Lauren swimming in that pool. He knew our founding fathers not as Professor O'Neill, Dr. Winans, or Dr. Woolbert, but as Jim O'Neill, Chief Winans, Charlie Woolbert. He says when he uh, missed a meeting in 1945, that's how he got elected executive secretary. <laughs> says when they delivered the contents to Switzer Hall, the entire contents of MCA would fit on a small rug. So there were two typewriters, an address machine, and some back issues of the journal, and a box of some paper clips. First, he was pleased when he got the receipts of the association. They were several hundred dollars. It was the next week, he says, that he received the bill for $3,000. He didn't know what to do. He thought the association would end with him. He went to his banker and said, I'm with this association. We need a loan. And the banker said, well, I don't know this association you're with. But I know you, and I know Gus. You co-sign, we'll give you the loan. And that's what he did for $10,000, the first loan Lauren Reed ever uh, extended. But because of him, we are here. And thanks to Lauren Reed and an agency located not too many miles from where we are this evening, uh, he helped clarify our relationship with that agency. It was in 1947 that he received a letter from the Internal Revenue Service saying, we believe you are a manufacturer and you owe $560. <laughs> then Lauren says it wasn't long after that that he got a telephone call from the IRS agent. Do you employ more than three people? Well, yes, we do, said Lauren. Do you manufacture a product? Well, yes, we have subscribers. Do you have advertising for which you're paid money? Yes, we do. Well, then you are a manufacturer and you are liable for a manufacturer's tax. You owe $560. No, I'm not a manufacturer. If you're not a manufacturer, then what are you? I am a humanitarian. <laughs> and what is a humanitarian? The Lord said this. A humanitarian is a person who does good for people. In 1947, he wrote, my association serves teachers who help young folks make speeches and learn skills like conversing and interviewing. The journal we publish contains articles that help teachers do these things better. I do not intend to make a profit, but I do make, need to make expenses. I am a person who helps people. That is why I say I am a humanitarian. I'm going to need to get to my, my supervisor. Supervisor comes on the line. Lauren repeats his spiel, but it wasn't long that he heard Mr. Spaulding, the supervisor, say, the professor is correct. He is not a manufacturer. He is a humanitarian. We can drop the case against him. Lauren says in all the years of dealing with people at NCA, he doesn't remember a lot of people, but he said, I will never forget the name of Mr. Spaulding. <laughs> when I saw Lauren this spring, I told him that I would have this moment in front of you, and I said, Professor Reed, is there anything you would like me to say to this gathering? I said, there will be 5,000 people in at the convention, not necessarily at this presentation, but here gathering. Oh, my, he said. Is there something you'd like to say? He thought for a moment, and he said, yes. Tell them to hang in there. Keep going. Don't give up, he said. Then he thought for a moment, and with his hand he said, the more the merrier. <laughs> well, tonight, we have reason to make merry, for we are celebrating excellence with the individuals that in just a few moments we will recognize for their excellence in teaching, research, and scholarship. We will celebrate a wonderful discipline that we're part of. Now, George Bailey saw not only how he had direct influence on those in his life, his family and friends, but how through him 
indirectly he influenced others. Clarence showed him that if he wouldn't have saved his brother, the troop ship that his brother saved, those lives would have been lost. So therefore, George had an impact on hundreds and hundreds of people he had never met. And so with us. A statement in our journals and in our strate strategic plan says, the NCA serves the scholars, teachers, and practitioners who are its members by enabling and supporting their professional interest in research and teaching. I think we should add one more constituency to that list. I would also add, we also serve our students. And through our students, they influence countless others. Let me make my point. If each of you, on average, taught, let's say, 200 students a year, just the people in this room during your careers would influence 4 million students. The entire association membership this year during their careers, entire careers, 56 million students. And we have been doing that for 99 years. It's Zuzu who chirps at the end of the movie. Teacher says, every time a bell rings, you know the rest. <laughs> the angel gets its wings. Well, I suggest that what we do as communication scholars and educators, strengthened by our affiliation with the National Communication Association, is to give wings to our students, to help them find their path, to help them find their North Star, to help them soar to new heights. We use the power of communication to transform their lives and ours. About halfway through the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, if you freeze frame the film, you will see a sign under the late Peter Bailey's photo, George Bailey's father. The sign says, look for it, see if you can find it when you're watching it. The sign says, all you can take with you is that which you have given away. What NCA has given away is a national network of communication educators who form an association to change lives. Lauren Reed was right. We are humanitarians. We are good people speaking well. We are good people doing well. Congratulations to each of us. With renewed gratitude, may we be thankful for our national connections, our national community. With renewed insight, may we value the added knowledge from communication studies that we have advanced all forms of communication and will continue to do so. With renewed appreciation, may we celebrate the bridge building voice to celebrate community, to establish connections for the presence of our pasts. No NCA? What would we miss? Three words. National Communication Association. It's a wonderful discipline. <laughs> Thank you for the honor of serving as your president.